Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 723. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 15th, 2022. All right, I want to thank you guys for your prayers for my cataract surgery. All turned out well, and uh, my left eye is now 2020. George, I can see something I haven't been able to see since I was four years old uh, with without wearing glasses. So it's it's kind of cool. I have another surgery scheduled for the other eye uh, in a week or two. Um, the worst part about having cataract surgery is I'm not allowed to to ride my bicycle because. The doctor's afraid I, I may injure my eye or uh, push too hard, and, and then she'll have to refix it and stuff like that. So that that's the worst part, George. How long are, how long are you off the bike for? Uh, well, I've kind of been bicycling. But if my doctor's not watching this, I've been off the bike since surgery, the, since last Thursday, and uh, I'm supposed to be off the bike uh, for seven days for each surgery. So... Uh, technically, I can go biking tomorrow, but we'll see what happens. You know, but isn't have... it wonderful? Yes, I was just going to say, isn't it wonderful the things they can do with surgery these days? I mean, you've had glasses since you were in elementary school, and oh, now, sure. now yeah. here, forty odd years later, you're you're forty, you're going to be free. <laughs> well, it's interesting. The same, you know, technology and science that allows us to. Uh, save the life of Ben Kwashi, who had uh, colon cancer, or you know, do such wonderful uh, life-saving treatment now for childhood leukemia, leukemia and stuff like that. Is you, works also in the, uh, you know, the eye industry. You know, they're allowed to put little mini lenses into your uh, eyes after cataract surgery, which does a full correction. I had really bad stigmatism. I even with glasses, I never had vision this good. You know, it is what it is. And so they're able to do a full eye correction. And I can uh, read close up and I can see far, far away. And I've never been able to do that. It's just modern technology. So. Uh, it's something I've always wished because at one time I wanted to be a pilot. And, uh, you know, you can't with really bad eyes like mine. Mm -hmm. And, oh, what a joy it would be to have wonderful vision like that. Oh, what a blessing. I I think because these are implanted lenses, you still can't be a an Air Force pilot. <laughs> Gravity's going to get. Do well, something. I, I I think <laughs> at this age, force. Kevin, they 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 may give us a pass on the at the recruiting office. So. Yeah, yeah well, oh, it depends how bad this war gets, but yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll they'll give us they'll give us a, a scraper, and we can scrape uh, back. What we can scrape bird dung off of the runway at the <laughs> in right. the air at the airfield. Well, I mean, you know, and I have to use a new face now. For the longest time, I've, I've worn glasses, and you know, I, I'm oh my god, the, look at the wrinkles and the the baggy eyes, and you know, my face looks like an unmade bed at times. So I have to get used to that. The audience is going to have to get used to that too. The, here, this well, is Kevin. Well, you know, it's like a Twilight episode well, where you do the reveal. You know, <laughs> so. Is Apple going to require new facial recognitions? I mean, do they believe do it's that. still you? No, I had to. I had to reprogram my uh, iPhone with my new face. <laughs> I've had to, you know, it is what it is. But uh, wow, to be in 2022. George, people are going to say uh, the number one question is not Kevin's eyes. It's, is George got a mortgage yet? No, George doesn't. The mortgage companies have come back about... One I've been working with for 90 days, and we were to close March 1st, and they mm -hmm. haven't. And so about two weeks ago, I went to one of these uh, online ones, Rocket Mortgage, and I must say, they've really been professional and fast. In two weeks, they've done what the other local bank did 90 days. But now both of them have come back and said, well, we need a new appraisal because the old appraisal wasn't FHA uh, compliant. So I said, okay, well, when can we go to closing? Well, soon. What does soon mean? Soon as the uh, soon as the appraisal's done, mm -hmm. and oh, it's uh, and some of the questions it, it uh, are like in I almost think are inappropriate. I got an email saying we saw that you had one hundred and forty dollars in bank overdraft fees last year. What plans do you have to prevent that from happening again? Lower the fees. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's like yeah, I really. I really sought to have bank overdraft fees or, you know, I got out and got drunk and I called up Bank of America and said, oh, charge my account, just fees for the heck of it. Now, it it's 
in talking to the, I've, I've talked, you know, and there's so many layers of uh, responsibility at these places so that <clears throat> the, the, the one person I talked to is very sympathetic because they get a commission if they close the deal, but then the uh, processor, the one who goes through the numbers is very hard nosed uh, because they have to make sure they're not, companies not being defrauded. And the process, uh, the loan dealer or the loan salesman is basically saying, you know, with this new market, the economy, the Russians, the, the inflation, this and that, all of the loan criteria are just being tightened so dramatically the, the good old days of uh, no questions asked mortgage lending uh, are far gone under this new scenario. So, No, and they are. Uh, but <clears throat> I can imagine somebody else having more trouble than you getting a loan. Putin would have trouble getting a loan right now. Uh, no, he's he, a cash buyer, Kevin. He's a cash he's buyer. He's a cash buyer. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, let's move on to that. That's enough but about he, our... Yeah, but you know these are first world problems. Getting a mortgage yeah. is of nothing compared to being a refugee on the roads out of Kiev. Yeah, uh, it, it, praise God that this is the problem I have. Yeah, yeah, you, we you know the, we have first world problems and you know great uh, medical tech, medical technology. Eventually, they're going to sign the paperwork that you're going to get a mortgage. Uh, I think between the two of us, I still have the longest uh, mortgage closing, which was 30 days, but y you're going to get there soon. Kevin, I don't want to challenge you on that. <laughs> you uh, challenge. I, I have, I, in my sermon on Sunday, I confided mm -hmm. to the congregation, oh, good news is people are coming back. We've got some of the, the final holdouts, mm -hmm. not, the, not all of them, but we're starting to see holdouts of COVID. People who haven't been here two, uh, two years plus come back. Awesome. Well, I mentioned in my sermon that uh, it must be very irritating being married to a priest because my wife, uh, who's also going the loan process with me, is on edge. See, we've lived in church housing or rented accommodations for 30 plus years, and this is the first. Susan wants to finally be able to buy curtains where it's her house and she yeah. can do what she wants. So she's quite keen to get this done. And so she's on edge with every question and she's wants to complain and I respond, it's all in God's time. The Lord will provide. She wants to hit me because <laughs> <laughs> she wants to have she wants to have someone to uh basically gripe and moan with. And being married to a priest who's a believing priest is the worst thing for a wife because you can't because you have to like smile and says, Oh yes, I have to be pious too. No, she doesn't want to be pious. She, so that's why she has her friends to uh, complain on the telephone about uh, George is such a jerk. I mean, he's telling me the Lord will provide. Of course, the Lord will provide, but he wanted to provide today. That's right. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, the, the patience when it comes to uh, mortgages and buying stuff is just, I, I don't have it, uh, and I don't expect anybody else to have it. Let's move on to some news here. I, I wanted to start with a fun story, and that's the one of the number one red stories on Anglican Inc. this week. And uh, Church of England clergy not permitted to perform baptisms wearing only underpants. And in, in, in any other world, any other denomination, I would expect that type of headline. We Here had a number. A... We've had a number of viewers uh, and readers say, is this a satire? Uh, it didn't help that we had a picture of Benny Hill looking quizzical <laughs> on this, but that's all I could think of that this was a Benny Hill skit this story out of the Church of England, but friends, it's a true story. Oh my. A... Well, let me read the no. first paragraph and you can respond to the story. Performing a baptism while dressed solely in one's underpants, while also pinching the bottom of a female par parishioner is conduct unbecoming for a clergy in holy or order, says a disciplinary tribunal. George, <laughs> tell us the story. Well, you need to have that Benny Hill background music now yeah. come in, and the little <laughs> short guy with no teeth, and the, the bald short guy running around mm -hmm. on the side. Well, evidently, and it's so, the priest involved, his first name is Clive. I mean, how, I mean, we've, we've got all the stereotypes and tropes here. Certificate. <laughs> Clive is about to go on vacation, and he's packed up the car, and his wife is in the car, and they get a phone at the vicarage. 
please come over and perform a baptism. We have an adult friend who was given his life to Christ and he wants a full immersion baptism. And Clive says, well, I'm about to go on vacation. And they say it's an emergency because, you know, he's just visiting, we don't know. And Clive sure. says, okay, I'll stop over on my vacation. And he pulls up to the house and he comes out and I don't know if it was at a pool, swimming pool or a uh, stream or a river, um, some water, uh, large thing that you could body climb of into. water, yes, <laughs> body of water, and they start the baptism. Well, first, Clive strips down into his shorts, takes off his shirt, his pants, his shoes, his socks, his undershirt, just has his shorts on, and the family is looking at him a little oddly. And the fellow gets in, and Clive, and is assisted by some member, female members of the family, perhaps the man's wife or whatever. And in the water, somehow or another, two women had their bottoms pinched. And the baptism is performed. And Clive gets out, puts his clothes on, and they're off. Just last week, the Diocese of Hereford concluded a four-year investigation. Now, the rubrics ornament of the Church of England in the 19th century was the one they fought over, whether or not you could wear a colored stole or had to wear a black black tippet, uh, things of that nature. Well, we had a rubrics ornament lawsuit again. And the rubrics ornament is that underwear alone is not sufficient clergy attire. Maybe if he had a stole on, in, in addition to his underpants, oh, no, I'm silly. The, 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 the tribunal said that there was no, I'm going to read it from, from, from its findings, there was no extreme urgency which might conceivably be imagined to justify a state of semi-nakedness. So for our, uh, we have one Church of England bishop who we've been teasing for years who was a nudist and wrote about God and nudism. I'm afraid she can't, or maybe she can't, you can be totally naked, but I mean, it, so it, you it, can be it, nudist but not an underpantist. I don't know how right. that would work. The, the, the complaint here is about only underpants. It doesn't say anything about doing the Adam and Eve. Um, and also, you know, when the Roman Catholics get baptism wrong, it's a discussion over I or we baptize. You know, it, it's, it's the magic word uh, discussion. Here, when the Anglicans do baptism weird, it's about underpants, George. That's, that's the cool thing about Anglicanism. Well, see, here's the thing. If it were Lutherans, the discussion would be briefs or boxers. I mean, what what That's type right. of underpants are, are you wearing? But for Anglicans, the, the, the ruling was um, there is a loss of dignity by stripping down to underwear in the circumstances in which it would occur, which is inherently inappropriate and unbecoming. Um, there's extreme, no, no extreme urgency, urgency might be con conceivably be imagined to justify this act. Mm -hmm. So, friends, I hate to tell you this, but, you know, at the next youth gathering, when you all go down by the riverside and you want to have a baptism, you have to keep your pants on. Uh, that's all I have to say. Mm. Oh, he, what was the penalty? The guy was given six months of further training. <laughs> what training possibly could you have for six months to say keep your pants on? Just, oh he, my! He was shopping at Walmart for for a swimsuit. That's the that's the training. How do you stop at Walmart on the way to an immersion baptism? You know that's got to be it. Let me uh, turn my noisy watch off here. Lots happening in the stock market today. I don't need to hear about it. All could right. you met? Here, here's the thing in in. Uh, in Florida, we get lots of European tourists, mm -hmm. and you can tell at a s moment's glance who the Europeans are, because Americans' men wear bathing suits that start around their, their navel and go to their knees. They wear board shorts, they wear yeah. these baggy things that look like basketball trunks. Mm -hmm. Europeans wear these uh, speedo type things that you as wear close in swimming to speedo races. speedo as you can get, yes, absolutely. Or thongs, and yeah. you know, and occasionally the lifeguard has to tell these uh, French or German women to put their tops back on. Um, when Susan and I, Susan and I uh, spend Novembers in St. Bart in St. Bart's as a par par parish there, and when we go to the beach, Susan's the only woman who keeps her top on. I mean, it's uh, 
the nudity and nakedness differs from culture to culture. Oh, absolutely. And I guess sure. Americans are more like the English of just keep your pants on, whereas the Germans, they're all nudists at heart. Uh, I don't well, think this would be an issue for I them. I think wives have more influence <laughs> in America about what the men get to wear to the beach. My wife would not let me show up in a thong or a uh, a speedo type. She basically, I have to wear a t-shirt and everything. You know, she, she does not want to reveal the 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 body unnaked of Kevin to the world. And I appreciate but that. Ke but Kevin, with the new Kevin, with the new gla without glasses, and uh, I mean, why don't you just shave your entire body and go <laughs> yes, all right, natural yeah. to the ocean? Uh, there's Adam. Oh my God, we're descended. <sighs> all right, on to our next story. Uh, big news. Uh, uh, was breaking that we, we saw with the ACNA2, ACNA2 website. Uh, we don't have the full story here, so we're just going to give you a, a, a pre-story. We'll do more reporting on this on Friday. Uh, we just we want to be fair to the story because it involves victims. And from what we're re reading here, the ACNA2 website made more victims. And so we want to be sure we do the story right. Uh, we've been very fair to the story from the beginning. We've got compliments from victims and from the families of victims of how we've covered the story. And we want to be sure that we continue in that because um, when something bad happens within the church, especially a, of a sexual nature, you want to be fair in your reporting, not humorous. You want to cover this with a straight face. And so in order for us, to, George and I, to do that, we need to get more and more uh, facts of how this, what's occurred. But what do we know so far, George? Well, <clears throat> what we've reported on Anglican Inc. is we've reported that Mark Rivera, a lay minister at, uh, at a uh, mission in the Diocese of the Upper Midwest in suburban mm -hmm. Chicago, has been arrested and charged with rape. Um, several counts of rape, including the raping of, uh, of a minor. And we've reported the police stories. We've reported the allegations. We've reported the, the facts that the diocese is investigating itself and the ACNA is investigating how this was handled. And that there are some people who have complained that this was not handled appropriately. Other outlets like the Religion News Service have taken uh, posts from a website called ACNA2, T-O-O, -O, uh, a play on the Me Too motif of a few years ago mm -hmm. and put out all these stories of uh, deliberate malfeasance and cover-up and uh, taking it a lot farther than Kevin you or I were comfortable in reporting because at this stage ACNA cannot in good conscience respond to point-by-point -point allegations because they're in the middle of an investigation and we don't track we don't seek to track down the other victims to get their side of the story so when these stories from the act, so the Mark Rivera story, that's out there. We've covered that in full, his the police blotter. We even posted the uh, sheriff's department, uh, Dupain County, DuPage, DuPage County, Illinois sheriff's blotter, showing his photo and everything. Can't say that we've held back, but we've not run with the commentary and accusations put on ACNA 2's website, where Religion News Service has. Well. And I think at the time, Kevin, you and I were describing that the story just didn't feel right. We both um, <clears throat> mentioned that our spidey senses are on. Something here isn't working. And it, you know, when, when the reaction is almost as bad as what they're reacting to, you, you got to say, ooh, something's not right here. And we did. And in, in fairness, you know, we knew something wasn't right. Now, now we know more. And I've covered... I don't want to say hundreds, but dozens of mm -hmm. church abuse cases. And where I've come down is that sometimes the lawyers involved gin things up to get a bigger settlement. Mm -hmm. And I therefore I've had to sort of step back and be quieter in my reporting so as not to play into the hands of people who seek to do something that is not in the line of justice or in the line of truth. That having been said. Mm -hmm. All the other victims that are known of Mark Rivera have now come forward and put out a joint letter, um, which has been published, and we'll put it up on Anglican Inc. Uh, in due course, which basically says that ACNA 2 does not speak for us, mm -hmm. that their accusations are, and their experiences do not follow our experiences of dealing with 
the diocese and the diocesan hierarchy. So at this stage, we have a he said, she said. We have victim A saying that her child was molested. There doesn't seem to be any doubt of that. But the, but the parish and the diocese and the bishop's reaction was, don't bother me. Now we have victims B through Z saying, we've been molested, but the diocese has been helpful and uh, sorrowful, and we haven't detected any malice or cover-up in our dealings with them. They may not be the most professional and have a machine that just grinds on because it's the first time they've done this, but the experience that victim A has is not what we've had in dealing with the hierarchy. So ACTA's national board can't comment on this because it's an ongoing investigation. It would uh, basically prejudice and make, you know, any final determination they have if ACTA's officials get, tell us what they think now, that basically poisons their well. But uh, for me, it's a less abuse occurred and the person responsible should be jailed severely sanctioned and if it is found to be true that there was a cover-up those involved should be nailed and punished for that but the automatic assumption that there was a cover-up has to be challenged you have to be guilt innocent to proven guilty which it was kind sense. of the whole operandi of the two movement uh, back you know when we had the Supreme Court judge nominations and all that was guilty by association guilty by accusation if mm -hmm. you were accused you were guilty and you know we have to get beyond that mentality there is a process of investigation here and the ACNA has submitted to that process and and signed a contract with a third party who will fully investigate this and we have to have faith in that if you don't have faith in the process um, you need to back up a little bit and let the process happen and then make your comments um, you, you can't you know preclude what the outcome is going to be if you haven't seen the outcome mm -hmm. so it, it's a crazy story it's hard for George and I to, to comment on this type of thing because we don't have all the all, all the information in front of us right now if people would like to uh, uh, contact us and I'll you know provide an opportunity to interview uh, you as a victim if you want to do this uh, closed screened um, we can do that but you know George and I want to step back and continue our fair reporting on uh, the the Mike Rivera situation and we we want justice to be uh, to hold Mike uh, Mark accountable and the church accountable where, where it failed you know we're, we're, we're into that that's what Anglican Inc and Anglican Unscripted is all about is the accountability of the church and I know this from my own personal life experience and uh, from being a pastor for all these years is that if you hold on to hate hate captures you mm -hmm. if you you got you have to forgive those who've hurt you you have that doesn't mean what they did is right doesn't mean they should not receive just punishment for their actions but Christ calls us to forgive our enemies, turn the other cheek, and in doing so, it frees us from, excuse me, bug out exterminator. <laughs> Once okay. is, they're coming this afternoon to the church, so. Huh. Yes, I know you're coming, be quiet. Uh, what I wanted to say is that Christ calls us to forgive our enemies, and that frees us from the burden of that pain when we forgive. Not forget, yeah. not make oh. it right, but not hold it in hatred in our hearts. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, yeah, forgiveness is not forgetting. Absolutely. And so, all right, good enough for that. We'll talk more about this on Friday. Just give George and I, you know, the opportunity to, to learn more uh, about that before we uh, talk about stuff we don't know about, which we don't like to do, George. Uh, Archbishop Vigano has an article on Anglica.inc that we reprinted, reprinted uh, posted his uh, PDF on, and he's like, you know, I just want you to let you know that not everybody in this situation is righteous or holy uh, between the Russian and Ukrainians. And um, before this conflict broke out, uh, most people, policymakers, international uh, delegates around the world knew that Ukraine was corrupt. 
no secret there. And the politicians in Ukraine, uh, since the breakup of the Soviet Union, have gone through different stages of corruption. They've had uh, good leaders uh, very infrequently. And he just wanted to point this out. Please don't think that uh, all the characters here are righteous. We posted that story, and it's got a lot of comments and feedback, George. I thought we could talk about that. Yes, it's the most popular. Uh, all the Vigano stories are always our most popular, I think, because we get a cross-cultural audience because the Catholic press tries to suppress Vigano. So sometimes uh, we are, and there are conservative Catholic outlets, but uh, sometimes people from the Catholic world come and look at the things we write because you can't get them as easily. Yeah. Well, Archbishop Vigano was the formal nuncio of the United States, and he was involved in the uh, basically trying to clean up the U.S. hierarchy from the pedophile scandals and all this and that. Um, he's been a controversial figure. He's at war with Pope Francis, uh, war of words. Uh, he's a firm believer in the uh, illegitimacy of the 2020 elections of, of fraud in some states, local, I mean, local instances of fraud that made the difference. And so he's become a lightning rod. Some people dismiss him out of hand as a fantasist and a conspiracy theorist. Other people say, you know, look, this man is not dumb and he's raising things that can't just be tossed away as mere conspiracy thinking. Well, he's written a several thousand word article about the Ukraine and Kevin summarized it aptly. Uh, this is not a, uh, good guys, bad guys, black and white situation. Uh, Ukraine is more corrupt on the rankings of world corruption than Mexico or Honduras or uh, some of the shining stars in Africa. Uh, it's it's like at a Somalia level of corruption. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a pay to play place that that was the whole uh, Hunter Biden scandal. Well, so first off, he's saying we shouldn't just automatically say that the Ukrainians are heroes. And second, saying you need to understand what, where the Russians are coming from, because if you don't understand where the Russians are coming from, then you'll never understand how this can be resolved without ongoing wars and hatred. And so he outlines the Russian position, which is that the Ukraine has violated the 2008 Minsk agreements, which were to allow these two Eastern Russian majority areas to become part of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, that the pr referendum in the U in Crimea, 97%, over 90% of all people voted to join Russia over Ukraine. And Ukraine promised to be non-aligned, non-nuclear. Non and now it wants to join NATO. Zelensky's talking about nuclear weapons. And Putin for 15 years is saying, the, if you step across this line, we will act. And so... That's controversial because some people like to just say Zelensky, uh, Putin is a monster, and this is a new Hitler. People and, want to people want to pretend that Putin woke up one day and said, "I'm going to invade Ukraine," mm -hmm. and other people say, "Well, he was forced into a corner." I'm mm -hmm. of the belief that Putin was forced into a corner, but acted incorrectly in going to war and invading, where he had the economic power to cut off the gas to all of Europe. And that would have been much more effective a way to uh, solve the Ukrainian crisis uh, for the Russian side than to and, what they're doing. And Vigano also made no friends by basically saying that uh, why was it that Donald Trump was able to contain Putin and work with Putin um, and Obama and Biden saw Putin send his armies across the borders. Well, it's because Trump understands the world uh, and the mindset of Putin's and how to deal with the Putin's and the, and the North Korean dictators and basically find a deal that, that, you know, the art of the deal. Well, but the deeper issue that Vigano raises, which is some people dismiss out of hand completely, is that this is all part of this whole Davos New World Order. The whole wars, the whole system is part of a of a move to recreate a new world system of the elites and that this war in the ukraine is partially driven by the desire to make money by the arms dealers the arms manufacturers the bankers on both sides um that the 
this is again in other words the person who pays the bill uh the person who paid the bill for the war in iraq and afghanistan was the 18 year old high school volunteer who joined the army and served two tours mm -hmm. and lost a leg the bankers in new york or in london who financed this and who pushed the government and who sent billions of dollars in aid um of which they kept their cut they they're not touched by any of this so Vigano is essentially coming from a, a from a very populist perspective and it's a and again it's not pro putin it's a pox on both their houses putin and zelensky plus we need to get rid of the clowns running our governments in the west mm -hmm. he lays into the italian government he lays into the french government he lays into the british government he lays into the biden administration and to some of the things that the trump administration did put us to this place such that we're in a place where it's august 1914 where incompetent politicians are dithering while the machinery is in set for us to go to war so for instance if if we listen to that i have a very harsh opinion on them but uh, lindsey graham the republican senator from south carolina that we should shoot down the russian planes and declare no fly zone that's the same thing as mobilizing the russian army in 1914 the germans have to respond and world war one starts mm -hmm. if we start shooting down russians they're going to shoot down us and the war will start because putin will have no choice and we will think we have no choice and to to have these po political leaders now see you here's the thing you need to distinguish between the plot and this is what some religious leaders like francis is doing and the orthodox leaders are doing um and some anglican leaders are doing all right you need to distinguish between the political world and the humanitarian world stop the war francis pope francis says because it's hurting people is different from stop the war because putin is a warmonger it's a different argument and you can talk to putin about stopping the war to take care of refugees to allow international aid to make sure these things happen but if you tell putin he's a monster in the next hitler you know the war will continue and get worse so we just have silly po political leaders in a time of world crisis that could easily push this over the edge it could push it over this but but hear us that what putin is doing is wrong Mm -hmm. and yeah and certainly in my eyes evil yeah you know this he could have won this a, a completely different way he did not have the skill set to do this in a political way his only knowledge and skill set here that i can tell was to do this in the violent way where you know it, it could have been done on a, a much bit different international scope and here's how confused it is politically in the united states uh tulsi gabbard who is a democratic candidate for president uh last time around she didn't do very well she was probably one of the more conservative she was the most conservative democrat, democrat absolutely yeah. um very attractive telegenic photogenic woman congresswoman from hawaii basically uh said that look uh why are we funding bio wo bio war labs in the eastern ukraine along the russian border mm -hmm. that could uh like the wuhan lab in china why are we funding these things and then you have Republican Senator Mitt Romney accusing Tulsi Gabbard, a Democrat, of being a tra traitor, a treasonous talk for even mentioning the bio labs. So we have Victoria Newland, the former uh, State Department official, and I think she's a State Department official again, saying, yes, we're working to evacuate these bio labs. And then Jen Psaki, the White House press spokesman, saying, there are no bio labs. Um, and, you know, we're. we're, we're it, and then people throwing around talk of war crimes. Um, well, here's the thing. When we bombed an aspirin factory in Khartoum, uh, thinking it was a, it was a, it went, uh, under, uh, uh, under, uh, Clinton, that was a war crime because we're not allowed to bomb non-humanitarian yeah. targets. Yeah. When Lindsey Graham calls for the assassination of, uh, Putin, that's a war crime. Um, it's the looseness of which people use language and the the quick move to demonize people rather than to resolve this and seek the will of christ um 
but I, I, I am know, sympathetic to Vigano's views. I don't buy all of them, but I'm very sympathetic no, to what he's saying. I, I'm, I'm sympathetic because <clears throat> history plays out different than it does uh, in in first reports. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to go back. I, I mentioned Kuwait in our last show. I'm going to go back to uh, the baby food factories of Iraq. Uh, you know, it's, it's the fog of war, you know, and we don't know uh, what's being done uh, until years later. Uh, we, we bombed a white uh, yellow cake uh, radiation making factory in, the, in in southern Iraq and uh, uh, on the TV screens all over the world the next day were Iraqi soldiers wearing baby food uniforms because it was a baby food factory <laughs> and how dare America do this war crime and this is this is the fog of war you're gonna see played out uh, by Pravda Russia and Pravda Ukraine where they want to get their story out. Um, Ukraine will tell you that they've killed 15,000 soldiers that, uh, of Russia, uh, Russian soldiers. The CIA says it's more like 2,000. Well, that's, just, that's, that's the, 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 the machine. We need to be sure that uh, Russians know that they're losing. And we're not going to know until this is all over what the truth was. You know, we're still going through Civil War documents hundreds of years later, figuring out the truth of some of these battles. You're thinking you're going to find out what happened between Russia and Ukraine uh, watching CNN or CBS or NBC or Fox News? No. What this is, bothers this is me, the fog. What yeah. bothers me from an American perspective is the abandonment of the rule of law. I see these people, the New York City government leaders, saying we're going to confiscate these homes belonging to Russian oligarchs who are friends of Putin. Well, in the United States, the rule of law prevails mm -hmm. and you have to go to trial you have to have a, a actual crime you actually have to have an actual war the united states has not declared war on russia yeah. um no laws have been broken in the united states and yet people are quick to try to confiscate uh bank accounts you can't do bank that. accounts yeah. um trying to uh uh so we're going to well we're going to destroy the russian economy uh joe biden says well we're not at war with russia um, well, under what uh, authority he, is he acting? Now, maybe because he destroyed the American economy. I was going to say, as destroy long as he's Russian destroying economy. our economy, <laughs> I don't mind if he takes out Russia and China at the same time. You know, if you're going to do us, take like, all the superpowers out. But there needs to be, you know, proper debate on this point. There needs to be a free, fair, you know, uh, you just can't confiscate things. The, you know, nobody gave Joe Biden war powers. They've, the, the, the administration has gone from COVID powers so that an unelected bureaucrat, Dr. Fauci, could shut down the economy to now war powers. Now that COVID is gone, who's heard of Dr. Fauci in the last month? War powers where, where the uh, Treasury and the government can uh, basically and shut down. The, and, and then we're here seeing absolute stupid stuff. Like I saw this Welsh Symphony Orchestra has just canceled its Tchaikovsky concert because Tchaikovsky is a Russian. He's been dead for 128 years. What has he got to do with this? You know, just no, this I, is this really is 1914 in some aspects. It's just the worst jingoistic, small-minded uh, people well, running it, the show. No, it's worse than that, George. We went from <clears> a <throat> working society to overnight pandemic and uh, Russia aside to pre Magna Carta. Nobody has rights anymore, and the law can't protect you. You know, mm -hmm. the government uh, is once in control. And to Vigan's point, we now have elitists that are trying to run everything. And uh, once you ru lose the rule of law, the, the, the poor aren't taking over. It's the elitists who are taking over. So, mm -hmm. ah, well, enough of our politics, George. It, it just shows we watch too much uh, news or read too much news. Oh, boy. Let's get back to some church news. As we reported um, 12 months ago, 13, uh, pre-pandemic, that the United, United Methodist Church was going to, to split. The conservatives uh, and the liberals had uh, voted that uh, in the next couple uh, church meetings, national church meetings, that they're going to find a way to split. And uh, this was largely supported by the uh, international branch of the United Methodist Church and nobody was happy i wasn't happy about it i don't want to see a church split but the episcopal church is like you know finally there's people we can work with in the united methodist church 
we can have a concord. We can work with these people and come to full communion with those who want to split and divide and agree with the gay agenda. Okay, let's report that story, George. Well, as uh, uh, go to Juicy Ecumenism if you really want to see the blow by blow, uh, yeah. Jeff Walt and Company's website on the Civil War within Methodism. The Methodist liberals and conservatives have basically come to a point where they've agreed to a divorce. The bureaucrats holding the in the powers centers of authority have postponed yet again. I think it's a general assembly, general council meeting, so that there's no divorce for another year. And the Episcopal Church, which is on the verge of signing a concordat of communion with the Methodists, has said, well, we're going to have to postpone that too, because we want to make sure we don't have a concordat with the wrong sort of Methodists. We want to have a concordat with the right sort of Methodists. So we're going to wait for them to split and then cozy up to our sort of Methodists. Which are not my sort of Methodists, but not I guess I, I'm not. Uh, or, been, I've or not my been sort of Episcopalians. <laughs> I've not been asked, so there yeah. you go. But it's uh, the uh, the Methodists have gone through the same fights the Episcopal Church has with, and in some, many ways, it's a mirror of the two with rampant illegality to achieve an end, and then once that end is achieved, bullying and uh, dictatorial powers to make sure that their point of view is uh, the only one that's accepted. Mm -hmm. However, the Methodists, uh, conservatives, were able to stick together and pull in their African allies so as not to allow the fiasco that happened to the Episcopal Church, which birthed the ACNA, among other things, to happen to them. But now the, the, the uh, marriage is over and they're going to get divorced. And just as we saw it with the Lutherans and the Anglicans uh, and the Presbyterians, we're not going to see it with the Methodists of a left-right split. Okay, George. Well, that's all the stories I have written down. We've got the hymnal, the hymnal. Oh, yeah, the ACNA hymnal. Now, as we talked about in the pre-show, I can't imagine anything more scary than sitting down with a, a group of clergy and lay people and saying, we're going to write a new prayer book. You know, now's the time we, we've got momentum on our side. Let's sit down and, and and pen to paper all the woes we've had with the last uh, uh, 13 prayer books. It's time to, to, time to move on. Well, the ACNA has now said we're going to take on the hymnal. And, you know, I, I don't know. How many, you know, with modern mu music, how many choruses can you put in one page, George? Yeah. This is a this is more dangerous than prayer book revision, hymnal revision, because most people, well, most people in churches sort of zone out, and they've got a few who want to have the uh, the prayer of humble access here and not there and stuff. But when you take out onward Christian soldiers or you add in some seventies Christian music, you're going to get pushback. Yeah, hold the. On. Uh, automatic cat litter box started to go all right you this is unless handled smoothly this is the most dangerous reform that you can make because people love music and if their favorites disappear they get angry and if you get in place something that they think is hard or tacky or uh, uh, if you raise them up on eagle's wings is now uh, you know <laughs> oh, no. Yes, <laughs> with at the Bette Midler version, uh, you know <laughs> that will cause more grief than anything that you could possibly do about the filio cause in the Nicene. Well, you know, or you, you include all the vineyard songs from the seventies, or you know all all the modern stuff. I, I don't know how you can do this uh, unless you just include the old hymns. Uh, if you start adding modern music, I don't know. I'm glad I'm not there to to. Don't take my opinion, whatever, but uh, Ike's. Uh, well, this is Lent, this season that we're in right now, and this is the time of year that the mus church musicians pull out the most unsingable, most dour hymns that nobody knows the words to. Uh, 
And then uh, it's funny to see, listen to the singing in the middle of the service when we've got these Lenten hymns before the gospel or whatnot. And then the closing hymn is something everybody knows and the volume picks up. So, oh my. Be careful, ACNA, with what you do with this hymnal. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, before we close out the show, let's do draw attention. Uh, Archbishop Foley Beach has called for people to give to the Anglican Relief and Development Fund uh, to help Ukraine. Uh, the refugee crisis, as you can tell in any news periodical, uh, liberal or conservative, Fox News or CNN, CBS or NBC, BBC, the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine is atrocious. And, you know, for a church that was not ready for the pandemic, it's good to see the Archbishop calling to, to help give for Ukraine relief. And we posted a story on Anglican.inc uh, for Archbishop Foley's calls, call for to give funds. I'm also going to post uh, a link to that in show notes as well. Uh, George, that's the show. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 723 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>